everyone. Welcome to theCUBE's presentation of the AWS Startup Showcase, Open Cloud Innovations. This is season two, episode one of the ongoing series covering the exciting startups from AWS Ecosystems. Today, uh, episode one's theme is the open source community and open cloud innovations. I'm John Furrier, your host. We've got two great guests, Webb Brown, C CEO of KubeCost, and Alex Leland, head of business development KubeCost. Gentlemen, thanks for coming on theCUBE for this showcase, AWS Startups. Thanks for having us, John. Great to be back. Uh, really excited for the discussion. Well, great yeah, to see you, John. CUBE alumni uh, from many, many KubeCons go. You guys are in a hot area right now, monitoring and reducing the Kubernetes spend. Okay, so first of all, we know one thing for sure. Kubernetes is the hottest thing going on because of all the benefits. So take us through you guys' macro view of this market. Kubernetes is growing. What's going on with the company? What is your company's role? Yeah, so we've definitely seen this growth firsthand with our customers in addition to the broader market. Um, you know, and I, I think we believe that that's really indicative of the value that Kubernetes provides, right? And a lot of that is just faster time to market, more scalability, improved agility for developer teams. And, you know, there's even more there, but it's a really exciting time for our company and also for the, the broader cloud native community. Um, so it, what that means for our company is, you know, we're, we're scaling up quickly to, to meet our users and support our users. Every, you know, metric at our company has grown about 4X over the last year, including our team. Um, and the reason that one's the most important is just because, you know, the, the more folks and the larger that our company is, the better that we can support our users and, and help them monitor and reduce those costs, which ultimately makes Kubernetes easier to use for, for customers and users out there on the market. Okay, so I want to get into why Kubernetes is costing so much. Obviously the growth is there, but before we get there, what is the, the background? What's the origination story? Where did KubeCost come from? Obviously you guys have a great name, cost, Kube. You guys probably reduce cost in Kubernetes, great name. But what's the origination story? how did you guys get here? What itch are you scratching? What problem are you solving? So yeah, John, you, you guessed it. Uh, you know, oftentimes the, the, the name is a dead giveaway there where we're cost monitoring, cost management solutions for Kubernetes and, and cloud native. Um, and backstory here is our founding team was at Google before starting the company. Um, we were working on infrastructure monitoring, um, both on internal infrastructure as well as Google Cloud. Um, we had a handful of our teammates join the Kubernetes effort, you know, early days. And uh, we saw a lot of teams, you know, struggling with the problems we're solving. We were solving internally at Google and we're, we're solving today. Um, and to speak to those problems a little bit, um, you know, you, you touched on how just scale alone is making this come to the forefront, right? You know, there's now many billions of dollars, you know, being spent on Kube. Um, that is bringing this issue uh, to make it a, a business critical question that is being asked in lots of organizations. Um, you know, that combined with, you know, the dynamic nature and complexity of Kubernetes um, makes it really hard to, to, to manage, um, you know, cost uh, when you scale across a very large organization. Um, so teams turn to Coop Cost today, you know, thousands of them do uh, to get monitoring in place, you know, including uh, alerts, recurring reports, and like dynamic management insights or automation. Yeah, I know. We talked at KubeCon before, Webb, and I want to come back to the problem statement because when you have these emerging growth areas that are really relevant and enabling technologies, um, you move to the next point of failure. <laughs> Right? So, so you're scaling, there's abstraction layers, now services are being turned on, more and more Kubernetes clusters are out there. So I have to ask you, what is the main cost driver problem that's happening in the Kube space that you guys are addressing? Is it just sheer volume? Is it different classes of services? Is it like different things are kind of working together? Different monitoring tools? Is it not a platform? Take us through the, the, the problem area. Well, what do you guys see this? Happening. Yeah, the, the number one problem area is still actually what uh, the CNCF FinOps survey highlighted earlier this year, um, which is that approximately two thirds of companies still don't have kind of baseline visibility into spend when they move to Kubernetes. Um, so, you know, even if you had a really complex, you know, chargeback program in place when you were, you know, building all your applications on VMs, you move to Kubernetes and, and most teams, again, can't answer these really simple questions. Um, so we're able to give them that visibility 
in real time so they can start breaking these problems down, right? They can start to see that, okay, it's these, you know, the de deployments or staple sets that are driving our costs, or no, it's actually, you know, these workloads that are talking to, you know, S3 buckets and, you know, really driving, you know, egress costs. Um, so it's really about first and foremost, just getting the visibility, getting the eyes and ears. We're able to give that to teams in real time at the largest scale Kubernetes clusters in the world. Um, and again, most teams, when they first start working with us, don't have that visibility. Not having that visibility can have a whole bunch of, you know, downstream impacts, um, including kind of not getting, you know, costs right you know, performance, right, et cetera. Well, let's get into that downstream benefit, uh, um, problems and or situations. But the first qu question I have, just to throw a naysayer comment at you, would be like, oh wait, I, I have all this cost monitoring stuff already. What's different about Kubernetes? Why, what's, what's the problem? I, I can, aren't my other tools going to work for me? How do you answer that one? Yeah, so, you know, I think first and foremost, containers are very dynamic, right? They're they're often complex, often transient, and consume variable cluster resources. And so, as much as this enables teams to construct construct powerful solutions, um, the associated costs and actually tracking those those different variables can be really difficult. And so that's why we see why uh, a, a solution like KubeCost that's purpose built for developers using Kubernetes is really necessary because some of those older, you know, traditional cloud cost optimization tools are just not as fit for, for this space specifically. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, Alex. And, and I would add to that, just the, the way that software is being architected, deployed and managed is fundamentally changing with Kubernetes, right? It is deeply impacting every part of software delivery you know, process. And through that, you know, decisions are getting made and, you know, engineers are ultimately being empowered um, to make more, you know, cost impacting decisions. Um, and so we've seen, you know, organizations that get real time kind of built for Kubernetes or built for cloud native um, benefit from that massively throughout, you know, their, their culture, um, you know, cost performance, et cetera. Uh, uh, well, can you just give a quick example? Because I think that's a great point. The architectures are shifting, they're changing. There's new things coming in. So it's not like you can use an old tool and just retrofit it. That sometimes that's awkward. What specific things you see changing with Kubernetes that's, that environments are leveraging, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Um, one would be all these Kubernetes primitives or concepts that you know didn't exist before, right? So, um, you know, I'm not you know managing just a generic workload. I'm managing a staple set and or you know three you know replica sets, right? And so having a language that is very much tailored towards all of these Kubernetes concepts, you know, abstractions, etc. Um, but then secondly, is like you know we're seeing this uh, very obvious you know push towards microservices where you know, typically again, you're shipping faster, um, you know, de teams are making more distributed or decentralized decisions uh, where there's not one single point where you can kind of gate check everything. Um, and that's a great thing for innovation, right? We can move much faster, um, but for some teams, um, you know, not using a tool like KubeCost, that means sacrificing having a safety net in place, right? Or, or guardrails in place to really help manage and monitor this. And I would just say, lastly, you know, a, a solution like KubeCost, because it's built for Kubernetes, sits in your infrastructure. Um, it can be deployed with a single Helm install. You don't have to share any data remotely. Um, but because it's listening to your infrastructure, it can give you data in real time, right? And so we're moving from this world where you can make real time automated decisions or manual decisions, as opposed to waiting for a bill, you know, a day, two days or a week later, um, when it may be already quote, too late, you know, to avoid. You're avoid fired these. by then. <laughs> or you got the extra cost. And nobody wants that. And you got to fight for a refund. Oh yeah, I threw a switch or I wasn't paying attention or human error or code. Um, because a lot of automation is going on. So I, I could see that as a benefit. I got I to gotta ask um, the question on um, developer uptake because develop, you mentioned a good point there that's another key modern dynamic. Developers are in, in the moment making decisions on security, uh, on policy, um, things to do in the CICD pipeline. So if I'm a developer, how do I engage with KubeCost? Do I have to, can I just download something? Is it easy? How's the onboarding process for your customers? 
Yeah, great, great question. Um, so, you know, first and foremost, I think this gets to the the roots of our company and the roots of Coop Cost, which is you know, born in open source. Everything we do is built on top of open source. Uh, so the answer is, you, know, you can go out and install it in in minutes, like you know, thousands of other teams have. Um, it is you know the the recommended route or preferred route on our side is you know a Helm install. Um, again, you don't have to share any data remotely. You can truly not lock down, you know, namespace egress, for example, on the KubeCost namespace. Um, and yeah, in, in minutes, you'll have this visibility and can start to see, you know, really interesting metrics. And again, most teams, when we start working with them, either didn't have them in place at all, or they had a really rough, you know, estimate based on maybe even a KubeCost Grafana dashboard that they installed. How does KubeCost provide the visibility across the environment? How do you guys actually make it work? Yeah, so we, you know, sit in your infrastructure. Um, we have integrations with, um, for on-prem, like custom pricing sheets uh, with cloud providers will integrate with your actual billing data um, so that we can uh, listen for events in your infrastructure, say like a new node coming up or a new pod being scheduled, et cetera. Um, we take that information, join with your you know, billing data, whether it's on-prem or in one of the big three cloud providers. And then again, we can in real time tell you the cost of you know any dimension of your infrastructure, whether it's one of the backing you know virtual assets you're using, or one of the application dimensions like a label or annotation, namespace, you know pod, container, you name it. Awesome, Alex. What's your take on the the landscape with with the customers as they look to cost reductions? I mean, everyone loves cost reductions. As a, certainly, I love the safety net comment that Web made. But at the end of the day, Kubernetes is not so much a cost driver, it's more of a, I want the modern apps faster, <laughs> right? So, so, so people who are buying Kubernetes usually aren't price sensitive, but they also don't want to get gouged either on mistakes. Where is the customer path here around Kubernetes cost management reduction and uh, uh, scale? Yeah, so I, I think one thing that we're looking forward to here in this upcoming year, just like we did last year, is continuing to work with the various tools that customers are already using and you know, meeting those customers where they are. So some examples of that are, you know, working with like CI CD tools out there. Like we have a great integration with Armory and Spinnaker to help customers actually take the insights from KubeCost and, you know, deploy those um, in a more efficient manner. Um, we're also working with a lot of partners like, you know, Grafana to help customers visualize our data and, you know, integrate with D2IQ or Rancher, which are management platforms for Kubernetes. And all of that, I think, is just to make cost come more to the forefront of the conversation when folks are using Kubernetes and provide that, that data to customers and all the various tools that they're using across the ecosystem. Um, so I, I think we really want to surface this and make cost more of a first class citizen across, you know, the, the ecosystem and, and the community partners. What's your strategy at the biz dev side as you guys look at a growing ecosystem with KubeCon, CNCF, you mentioned that earlier. Um, the community is growing, it's always been growing fast. You know, the number of people entering in are amazing. But now that we start going, you know, the S curve is kicking in. Um, you, integration and, and interoperability and openness is always a key part of company success. What's KubeCost's vision on how you're going to do biz dev going forward? Absolutely. So, you know, our product's open source. That is deeply important to our company. We're always going to continue to drive innovation on our open source product. Um, as Webb mentioned, you know, we have thousands of teams that are that are using our product, and most of that is actually on on the free, but something that we want to make sure continues to be available for the community and continue to bring that development for the community. And so I think a part of that is making sure that we're working with folks, not just on the commercial side, but also those open source um, types of products, right? So, you know, Grafana is open source, Spinnakers are open source. I think a lot of the biz dev strategies, just sticking to our roots and make sure that we're, we continue to drive a, a strong open source presence and product for, for our community of users. Keep that DNA and open source and get commercial and keep it stable. Well, I got to ask you, obviously the wave is here. I always joke uh, going back. I remember when the word Kubernetes was just kicked around pre uh, the OpenStack days many, many years ago. It's the luxury of being an uh, old cube guy that I am 11 years doing the cube, um, all fun. But if you we remember talking in the early days is that with Kubernetes was, a, if, if it worked, the, the phrase was rising tide floats all boats. I would say right now the tide's rising pretty well right now 
You guys are in a good spot with uh, the coop cost. Are there areas that you see coming where cost monitoring um, is going to expand more? Where do you see the Kubernetes, um, what's the aperture, if you will, of the, of the cost monitoring space that you're in that you think you can address? Yeah, I, you know, John, I think you're exactly right. This uh, tide has risen and it, you know, just keeps riding, rising, right? Like, um, you know, the the sheer number of organizations we use, see using Kubernetes at massive scale is just um, you know, mind blowing at this point. Um, you know, what we see is this really natural pattern for, you know, teams to start using a, a solution like KubeCost, um, start with, again, either limited or no visibility get that visibility in place and then really develop an action plan from there. And that could again be, you know, different governance solutions like alerts or, you know, management reports or, you know, engineering team reports, et cetera. Um, but it's really about, you know, phase two of taking that information and really starting to do something with it. Right. Um, we, we are seeing and expect to see more teams turn to an increasing amount of, of automation to do that. Um, but ultimately that is uh, very much after you get this baseline, highly accurate uh, visibility that you feel very comfortable making potentially critical, you know, very critical related to reliability performance decisions within your infrastructure. Yeah, I think getting it right is key. You mentioned baseline. Um, let me ask you a quick follow up on that. How fast can companies get there? When you say baseline, there's probably levels of baseline. Obviously all environments are different. No, not all ones the same, but what's just anecdotally do you see as that baseline? How fast do people get there? Is there a certain minimum viable configuration or architecture? Just take us through your thoughts on that. Yeah, great question. It definitely depends on organizational complexity and you know can depend on applicational application complexity as well, but I would say most importantly is, um, you know, the the array of call centers, departments, you know, complexity across the, the org as opposed to, you know, technological. Um, so I would say for, you know, less complex organizations, we've seen it happen in, you know, hours or, you know, a day less, et cetera, um, because it's, you know, uh, one or two or smaller engineering teams, they can share that visibility really quickly. And, um, you know, they may be familiar with Kubernetes and they just quote, get it right away. Um, for larger organizations, we've seen it take kind of up to 90 days where it's really about infusing this kind of into their DNA when, again, there may not have been visibility or transparency here before. Um, again, I think the, the, the bulk of the time there is really about kind of the cultural element um, and kind of awareness building um, and just buy-in throughout the organization. Awesome, well guys got a great product, congratulations. Final question for both of you, it's early days in Kubernetes, even though the tide is rising, keeps rising, more boats are coming in, harbor's getting bigger, whatever, whatever you want, metaphor you want to use, it's really going great. You guys are seeing customer adoption, we're seeing cloud native. I was talking to my friends at Docker, the container side's going crazy as well. Everything's going great in cloud native. What's the vision on the innovation? How do you guys continue to push the envelope on value in open source and in the commercial area? What's the vision? Yeah, I think there's there's many areas here um, and I know Alex will have more to add here. Um, but you know, one area that I know is relevant to his world is just more really interesting integrations, right? So he mentioned, you know, Coop Cost Insights powering decisions in say Spinnaker, right? I think more and more of this tool chain really coming together and really seeing the benefits of all this interoperability, right? Um, so that I think combined with uh, just more and more intelligence and automation being deployed. Again, that's only after the fact that teams are really comfortable with these decisions and the or, you know, information and the decisions that are being made. Um, but I think that increasingly we see the community again, being ready to, to leverage this information in really powerful ways. Um, just because, you know, as team scale, there's just a lot to manage. And so a team you know, leveraging automation can, you know, supercharge them in, in really impactful ways. Awesome, great integration. Integrations, Alex, expand on that. A whole different kind of set of business development integrations when you have lots of tool chains, lots of platforms and tools kind of coming together, sharing data, working together, automating together. 
Well, yeah, we, so I, I think it's going to be super important to keep a pulse on the new tools, right? Make sure that we're on the, the forefront of what customers are using and just continue to meet them where they are. And a lot of that, honestly, is working with AWS too, right? Like they have great services in EKS and managed Prometheus. Um, so we want to make sure that we continue to work with that team and, and support their services as they launch as well. Great stuff. I got a couple minutes left. I thought I'll throw one more question in there since I got two great experts here. Um, just, you know, a little bit change of pace, more of an industry question. There's really no wrong answer, but I'd love to get your reaction to um, the SaaS conversation. Cloud has changed what used to be SaaS. SaaS was, oh yeah, software as a service. Now that you have all these kind of new kinds of integrations, you have automation, horizontally scalable cloud and edge, you now have vertical machine learning, data-driven insights, a lot of things in the stack are changing. So the question is, what's the new SaaS look like? Is it the same as the old SaaS? Or is it a new kind of refactoring of what SaaS is? What's your take on this? Yeah, um, so Web, please jump in here wherever. <laughs> but in, in my view, um, it, it's a spectrum, right? There's there's customers that are on both ends of this. Some customers just want a fully hosted, fully managed product. They want to benefit from the luxury of not having to do any, any sort of infrastructure management or patching or anything like that. And they just want to consume a great product. Um, on the other hand, there's other customers that have more you know, highly re regulated industries or security requirements, and they're going to need things to deploy in their environment. Um, Right now, KubeCost is, is self-hosted, but I think in the future, we want to make sure that, you know, we, we have versions of our product available for customers across that entire spectrum. Um, so that if, you know, if somebody wants the benefit of just not having to manage anything, they can use a fully self-hosted SaaS or a fully multi-tenant managed SaaS or, you know, other customers can use a, a self-hosted product. And then there's going to be customers that are in the middle, right? Where there's certain components that are okay to be uh, SaaS or hosted elsewhere, but then there's going to be components that are really important to keep in their own environment. So I, I think uh, it, it's really across the board and it's going to depend customer to customer, but it's important to make sure we have options for all of them. Great, great. Uh, Webb, SaaS, same as the old SaaS. What's the SaaS playbook now? Gosh, I think it is such a deep and interesting question and one that um, it's going to touch so many aspects of software and, and, and our lives. I predict that we'll continue to see this, um, you know, tension or real trade-offs across, you know, on the one hand, convenience, and then on the other hand, security, privacy, and control. Um, and I think, you know, like Alex mentioned, you know, different organizations are going to make different, you know, decisions here based on kind of their relative trade-offs. Um, I think it's going to be of epic proportions. And I think, you know, we'll look back on this period and just say that, you know, this was one of the foundational questions of, of how to get this right. We ultimately view it as like, again, we want to offer choice um, and made, make every choice be great, but let, you know, our, our users uh, pick the right one given their, you know, profile on those, on those trade-offs in those yeah, areas. I think, I think it's a great comment choice. And also you got now dimensions of implementations, right? You know, multi-tenant, custom, regulated, secure. I want to have all these controls. Um, it's great. It's no one, no one SaaS rules the world, so to speak. So it's again, great, great dynamic. But ultimately, if you want to leverage the data, then is it horizontally addressable, uh, multi-tenant? And again, this is a whole nother ball game. I, we're watching this closely and you guys are in the middle of it with cube cost as you guys are, are creating that baseline for customers. Uh, congratulations, uh, great to see you Webb. Thanks for coming on, appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us again. Okay, great Take conversation. Care. AWS Startup Showcase, Open Cloud Innovators here. Open source is driving a lot of value as it goes commercial, going the next generation. This is season two, episode one of the AWS Startup Series with theCUBE. Thanks for watching.